Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the Hobbit convention. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, I'd like, like to welcome Nancy Conrad here. She's, uh, the, she created the Conrad Foundation in 2008 to energize and engage students in science and technology through unique entrepreneurial opportunities. The organization's flagship program, the Conrad Spirit of Innovation Challenge, is a global competition challenging students to combine education, innovation, and entrepreneurship to create products that address real-world challenges and global sustainability. By enabling young minds to connect education, innovation, and entrepreneurship, the foundation helps provide a bold platform for enriching the innovative workforce of the future. Ms. Conrad has been a featured speaker at national and international conferences. Her presentations include TED Long Beach, the Legatum Institute of MIT, and at the invitation of uh, King Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz, she spoke at the Global Harvard University and National Compe wait, Competitiveness oh, Forum. Yeah, it's a lot I'm of stuff. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Um, so anyway, she's been named one of the top 100 leaders in STEM education. And Ms. Conrad serves on the board of directors of the Presidential Scholars. So. <laughs> so good morning. Good morning. You get invited to speak about this topic a lot, the future of education. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it and its framing in general? Well, it kind of makes me crazy. Because um, the future of education is in a rear view mirror, kids. Um, we haven't done anything really innovative in 200 years. So we started this whole business to create a workforce for manufacturing. We were growing screw screws. And um, we kind of don't do that anymore. When people ask me what I do, I tell them I'm a farmer. And I get this look, and what do I grow? I grow unicorns. I grow <laughs> kids that really start these amazing companies and new technologies and new products and new systems. And so when asked about the future of education, um, I think we have to hurdle over what we have now, which is sort of a testocracy. Yes, we have to measure things, it's important, but we're not doing competency-based learning, and that's what we really need to do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I don't like to admire the problem, I'd rather go do something about it, so that's what I do. Oh, and by the way, our competition launches tomorrow, so if you've got high school kids, or any of you are high schoolers, check it out, it's conradawards.org, there's the plug. Okay. Um, what do you think about listening to the consumer and how you would engage <laughs> kids? That's sort of the biggest problem of it all. Um, I testified in Congress a few years ago, and they asked me how our competition had grown so quickly, and part of the reason was that we listened to our consumer. And I got these blank stares. Well, who's the consumer of education, guys? Tell me who's the consumer. Is it, who? The students. They're the consumers. Like, duh. And in, they're never at the table. They're the stakeholder who's never at the table of education. So we try to do things that are very student-centric. Our students pick their team. There's two to five in a team. They pick their coach, could be a teacher after school, could be a parent. They pick their product idea. Um, and there's four categories, aerospace, energy, cyber, or health. So essentially, it's the entire planet. And our kids get patents, and they own the patents. We don't own them. And many of them have commercialized their IP. They've dispersed products in multiple countries. Yeah, they've grown companies. I kid you not, we do grow unicorns. <laughs> um, and so it's very student-centric, and it's these kids are solving challenges. I don't like to talk about problems, because to me that has a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. So I talk about creative solutions, and that's what our students do. On that note, um, you live in D.C. What is the environment like there? <laughs> we call D.C. the district of corruption. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be pretty interesting here when we bring that to New York for the next few days. Um, you know, I think that the real changes in the education structure are happening 
around the perimeter. The Department of Education is interesting, but really doesn't have much impact in terms of what's going on in states. That's primarily governors and mayors that are controlling education per state. So the education piece in DC is kind of a whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. As for the other stuff, I'm not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, um, what's the real frame, and how, how, how would you frame education? How would I frame it? Yeah. In terms of how do we do something that leapfrogs where we yeah. are? What kind of methodology would you use? Ah, so I talk about the Cuisinart. You know, we've got knowledge as a commodity now. You can go on the internet and you can find out just about anything you want. You can go dial me up. You can go dial you up. We've got all kind of stuff to learn about each other. Um, so really, learning facts to take a test kind of isn't really that very important anymore. If you've got a good memory, you can pass any class, I think, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is, is do, we do competency-based learning. So you have to understand everything there is to know with regard to science, technology, engineering, math, entrepreneurship, uh, art, innovation, and to do what we do, to create a product out of nothing. And by the way, this year, it's taken us a year to put this together. We are launching the Conrad Design Method, and you can actually use it as a framework to understand how to do innovation and how to be an entrepreneur. So you can kind of come on our website and do that. Um, I don't use the word curriculum. I think it's an old-fashioned word because curriculum tells me I'm going to take a test. Mm -hmm. And this isn't about test taking. This is about actually doing creative solutions to big global issues. And then, who knows, you could become a unicorn or not. The point is you understand how to think and how to learn. And that's the magic of the way we, we teach. And, and how do you engage the students um, using the Socratic method and other? Yes, well, students come onto our, we, we live on the internet, which is where our students live, and our teachers live there as well. And now I get this thing in my jaw again, sorry. Um, so the kids come into this competition on the internet, it's a very easy level of entry. You do a, a one-minute video this year because I connected with a young man at Princeton, mm -hmm. and he said that one-minute video actually democratizes the video system. Okay, so we're doing one minute, and you give us your idea in a one-minute video, and then there's four questions to be answered, and then after that, you begin to develop your business plan and market study and visual representation. It's a funnel competition. It's difficult. Um, it went global organically. We never did a global outreach. It just happened. Kids dig this, teachers dig it. And um, it's sort of gotten rid of the classroom coma and the classroom Cuisinart. You know, we stick kids in and we jam a bunch of facts in their heads and then we spin them around. We shoot them out at the universe, have a nice day, and hope you can do something with your life. But that really isn't education. So what these kids come out with and what the teachers are able to do as they integrate with the students is really bring a framework to kids so that they can understand how to think and how to learn. And once you've done that, you can do anything you want to do. So it's, it's quite transformative mm -hmm. and very exciting. And you, you talk about giving kids it's, um, a moonshot. What inspired mm -hmm. you to approach it that way? So there's a backstory to the moonshot. So when this all started, um, I'm a teacher. And being a teacher is like being a spy. You know, once you're a spy, you're always a spy. <laughs> well, once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. So. My late husband was killed in an accident in 1999. And I looked at his life, and I really combined my passion for what I call transformative education with his story. So my late husband was expelled from school in the 11th grade. He had a problem reading and spelling. What was wrong with him, guys? 
dyslexia, you got it. They thought he was stupid. They didn't know what dyslexia was in those days, so they threw him out. And his mom took him to a little school in upstate New York that was expert at working with problem children, and he was a problem child. I don't, can't even imagine what would have happened to him had he not gone to that school. But he repeated the 11th grade. He was learning to fly at about the same time. And the headmaster at that school saw something in him, and the headmaster took him under his wing. And my husband ended up with a scholarship to Princeton. Uh, it was compliments of the Navy. I don't know if you know this, but the Navy will pay for your education. You become an NROTC scholar. That means you spend some time in the Navy. And then the scholarship was also compliments of Princeton. So Pete ends up at Princeton in the first class of aeronautical engineers. Anybody want to take a guess why you want to be an aeronautical engineer? Huh? Well, you love planes, but you don't have to read or spell to be an aeronautical engineer. So Pete graduated, he became a test pilot, and then when President Kennedy put out the word for a few good men, uh, women didn't get to fly in space in those days, my husband saluted, yes sir, I love to fly, don't really care where you're going, they were going to the moon, that'll work. And he ended up flying four flights in space, he flew Gemini 5, Gemini 11, he was the third man to walk on the moon on Apollo 12, and it was the first time science ever left Earth. And then he flew Skylab, which was our first space station, and it was damaged at launch, and he rescued the lab, hanging out on a tether, which they weren't sure was gonna really work. So he was a little nervous he might be the first arrow ever launched in space. But he ended up rescuing the lab, and for that he was awarded a Congressional Space Medal of Honor. Well, that's not bad for a kid that got thrown out of school, I would say, yeah? So then Pete went on to go back into the aerospace business, and toward the later years of his life, he was hard at work on the commercialization of space, um, building reusable launch vehicles, kind of what Branson Musk and Bezos are doing today really stand on the shoulders of Pete Conrad. Go check him out, and you won't, it, it's easier if you put in Charles Conrad. Uh, his father was Charles, father wanted a junior, mother wanted Pete. They named him Charles, called him Pete. Women always win, don't we? So, all of this happens for a kid, because an educator takes him under his wing, and the kid gets a moonshot. So, that's what I decided we would do, is give kids their moonshot. That's how it happened. Um, and can you describe a little bit the, um, what has made the Spirit of in Innovation Challenge so successful and how the business model is related to the moon? Ah, so when I started the program, I thought, well, what's the best business plan I've ever seen? There's a gazillion of them, right? Well, I turned to the roots and I looked at how we got to the moon. So how did we do that? It was leadership funding, government, industry, academia, and this thing is going in my throat again. Um, and the special sauce was collaboration. There were 400,000 people that sent these guys to the moon. So I'm the leadership. I was the funding for the first two years, and then my children were about to put me up for adoption because the thing grew really fast, and it grew really fast because we worked with government, industry, academia, and like we did on the moonshot, we collaborated. So I reached out to large organizations that had a lot of kids. I said, bring us the kids, we'll bring you a program. And that's how we've scaled, and we continue to work with partners all over the world now. What's the janitor story? What's the what? Janitor story. Oh, the janitor story. So, when this country went to the moon, there, everyone was engaged in the process 110%. And manned space flight was in uh, Houston at Johnson Space Center. Of course, Vice President Johnson at the time. By the way, it was Johnson that actually started the space program, and he sold it to Kennedy, who sold it. So now you know why Johnson Space Center is in Houston. Okay. So 
all of these people were down there interviewing and, you know, hanging out with astronauts, and that was cool. And there was a very, very um, famous Italian uh, journalist, and she went up to this guy and she said, so tell me, uh, what are you doing here? And he says, well, ma'am, I'm sending a man to the moon. So she interviews him for about an hour. And at the end of the interview, she says to him, now tell me your name again. He said, ma'am, my name is Mr. Johnson. No relation to the vice president, ma'am. And what is your job description here? Ma'am, I'm a janitor. So the moral of that is everyone was engaged with sending man to the moon. And it's that kind of commitment that we would hope today would educate our children. That same kind of zest and passion that this janitor had for his job is what we try to bring to our students and to their teachers and coaches in education. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions? Yes. I can answer anything about the moon that it, we really did go there, by the way. Here's one. <laughs> go ahead. Hello. Hi. Amazing, amazing lecture, number one. I loved it, and we weren't going to come, but we came just for this one <laughs> lecture, by the way. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. I, have, I homeschool my kids, and the reason, I'm going to tell you this, because my younger one was put on the spectrum, and his kindergarten teacher said to me at one point, and that's the day I decided to pull him out. And I'm kind of getting emotional because I heard your husband's story. And it really, like, it made me really emotional. Yep. His yep. kindergarten teacher said to me, I have 25 other kids to deal with. I cannot take care of one. I understand. And it hurt me so much. And now my, he's a seven and a half year old and he's already doing third, fourth grade math just because I worked hard with him. That's great. And it made me, I'm inspired. So this is my question. Sure. What would you recommend for parents at home? I'm a stay-at-home mom, but so many of these parents, they have jobs, and some of them are doing multiple jobs. So many moms are single parents, like not just moms, dads too, single parents. What would you recommend for parents at home how to bring the, because I, I don't believe in uh, gifted and talented as much because I think every child has, has a gift. the potential yeah, absolutely. to excel at everything they do. Something, some might be good at art, some might be good at science, but if, how can a parent bring that out at home? S tell me your name. It's Mehreen. You can Mehdi? call me Maureen. Maureen. Thank you for your question. Um, oddly enough, my grandson is also dyslexic. Um, and there's no blood relationship because I'm chapter two, best and final. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Um, we have a tutor for my grandson. It's very helpful. I know that the school cannot spend the time with these children. If you can connect with a really good tutor that understands this problem, um, that'll be helpful to you. I so admire your homeschooling. I wish I could have done that for my children back in the day. Uh, we get a lot of parents and a lot of homeschool kids into our competition. They seem to shine in a whole different way. So congratulations to you for doing that great work with your child. And don't worry about that dyslexia, he's probably brilliant.